morning, everybody. Uh, we are Neiman Hawk Aviation, and we are presenting to you our aircraft, the Joint Tactical Air Tanker. Uh, throughout this presentation, we're going to be referring to a primary and a secondary screen. Uh, my name is Emma Schneider. We have Bailey Sims, Joe Whipple, Spencer Carroll, Jacob Crittenden, Marcus Ross, Dominic Lammers, and Noah Garcia Brown. On the primary screen is an overview of what we're going to be going over today. Up next, we're going to talk about our motivation and mission. Currently, the Department of Defense is looking to acquire a new tanker. Uh, this tanker will need to be joint capable, which means it needs to be able to be used by both Air Force and Navy. It also needs to be able to refuel with both systems. Uh, this tanker will need to be tactical capable, so it'll need to be able to fly uh, into dangerous areas. It'll also need to be carrier capable, which means it'll need to be able to take off and land on a carrier as well as fit under deck and be able to park. Uh, our JTAT has all three capabilities. On the primary screen is our mission profile. We will take off from our uh, short dirt runway or uh, carrier deck. We will ascend to cruise where we will go to our 600 nautical mile combat radius mark to rendezvous with planes to refuel. At that 600 nautical miles, we will be able to offload 25,000 pounds of fuel we will then be able to head back to base. Uh, we will also be able to have enough fuel to abort a landing as well as divert to a different runway if necessary. On, our, on the secondary screen is our extended mission profile. The difference between these profiles is that our plane is fully capable to be refueled. And in this mission profile, we are able to go back and refuel more planes before heading back to base. Up next is Bailey Sims with aircraft configuration. Thank you, Emma. To begin with our configuration, we first looked at different aircraft for a comparison. The Sky Warrior, it was a naval attack aircraft. It was the largest aircraft capable of operations from an aircraft carrier. And it was able to be retrofitted with a probe and drogue system to allow it to refuel other naval aircraft. However, this aircraft is currently retired. The Super Hornet is a currently in operation naval fighter attack aircraft and it has the capabilities of refueling with fuel pods slung under the wing that allow it to refuel other naval aircraft. The currently in operation Air Force tanker is the Pegasus. This tanker is capable of refueling using the flying boom system as well as the probe and drogue system to refuel both Air Force and naval aircraft. On the secondary screen is a comparison of these aircraft. It can be seen that although the Pegasus has a larger fuel capacity than the JTAT, it is far too large to operate from an aircraft carrier. And while the Super, and while the uh, Super Hornet and Sky Warrior were capable of air, air, air carrier, carrier operations, uh, the JTA will have a larger radius of operations as well as a larger fuel offload for refueling. For our configuration choice, we chose a standard wing, con a standard configuration with a standard fuselage and standard wing. This is a well-documented design and allows for easy analysis. We chose a high wing configuration to allow for greater static stability as well as greater ground clearance, which will assist with carrier operations. On the primary screen is a three view drawing of the JTAT, and on the secondary screen are specifications for many of the lengths. Many of these lengths are constrained by both military and carrier requirements. On the primary screen is a depiction of the flying boom <coughs> system deployed on the JTAT. This is attached on the center line of the aft portion of the fuselage and is able to be controlled or flown by the co-pilot in the cockpit portion of the fuselage. On the secondary screen is our probe and drogue system. This is deployed from the most aft portion of the fuselage and allows the JTAT to refuel naval aircraft. I'll now be talking about the wing design. For wing design, I'll first talk about the airfoil selection. On the primary screen are uh, airfoil parameters for the airfoil we selected. And on the secondary screen is a depiction of the NACA 632615 airfoil. On the primary screen is a depiction of our wing plan form. It can be noted that all dimensions shown are in inches. 
Also shown in the drawing are our use of leading edge sluts, a trailing edge double slotted flap, as well as our aileron and our wing folding mechanism that will allow us to store the aircraft under deck of the carrier. On the secondary slide are wing planform parameters. The 20 degree wing sweep was chosen to balance between the increased lateral directional stability given by a wing sweep, as well as the needed, the CL max needed for a carrier landing. On the primary screen are our airfoil, airfoil and wing lift curves. The airfoil and wing are both shown at Mach 0.2, as well as the wing again at Mach 0.8. On the secondary screen are wing lift parameters for the clean configuration. Now on the primary screen is our wing with high lift devices. This is with both leading edge slats and trailing edge double slotted flaps deployed. On the secondary screen are our CL maxes in different configurations. The takeoff configuration is with only the trailing edge devices deployed and landing configuration is with both leading edge and trailing edge devices deployed. The CL maxes given in these configurations do satisfy constraints derived earlier that will allow us to take off from carrier and runways. I'll now like to hand it off to Joe to talk about the fuselage design. Thanks, Bailey. In designing the fuselage, there's quite a few constraints that we had to consider. Uh, the biggest constraint we had to consider was operating on an aircraft carrier. So in our request for proposal, it required that our aircraft, when stored under deck, could not exceed the space of two fighter jets. So the fighter that we picked to get the size requirement is the FA-18 EF model. This is the current fighter used by the Navy. As you can see on the picture on the primary screen, the lower picture of the F-18, our JTAF would have to fit into the size requirement of our length could not exceed the 60.3 feet, and our wingspan when folded wingtips could not exceed double that of the folded F-18. So our length constraint is the 60.3 feet. Another constraint that we had is our height constraint. So the minimum height under the deck of an aircraft carrier, as you can also see up on the primary screen, with the picture at the top, is 19 feet. So we cannot exceed that 19 feet. In designing the landing gear, the fuselage, and the empennage, all those had to be compromised to get the proper height. The height that we chose and compromised on for the fuselage was eight feet. We also chose an eight feet width for the fuselage giving us a circular cross-sectional area that gives us enough internal storage for the fuel and fuel systems that we need to carry while also minimizing the drag as much as we can. As shown on the secondary screen, you can see that we meet all these requirements. The aircraft is 60 feet long and is 18 and a half feet high. In the front of the fuselage, we've got the cockpit. The cockpit design uh, then we have a canopy that hinges up at the top, allowing the pilots to climb in, do the little deployable ladder, as you can see in the picture on the primary screen. This ladder comes down, and this is on both sides so the pilots can enter. On the secondary screen, there's requirements that we had to meet for military transport aircraft for pilot vision. So the nose over vision that we had to satisfy is 17 degrees and 20 degrees above horizon vision. You can see the picture on the secondary screen, we meet both of those uh, constraints. Continuing on, I'm talking about the cockpit. Both pilots would be sitting side by side. You can see the fuselage render in the primary screen. We chose ACES-2 ejection seats. These are common ejection seats used in modern military uh, fighters and bombers. The reason we chose to use ejection seats is one of the rules of the aircraft is a tactical role where it would be flying close to the FIBA and it has a chance of getting shot at in that instant. If that happens, the pilots need to be safe and have a safe ejection. If you look on the secondary screen, you can see the seats ejecting. The canopy is designed to split in half with explosive charges and then both pilots reject at the same time. 
They eject at the same time, so one pilot does not get burned by the other ejection seats rocket. Because the canopy is designed where it splits down the middle, this allows for zero, zero ejection, which just means zero airspeed and zero altitude. The seats can uh, eject and the pilots can be safe. This is a requirement for aircraft carrier operations. Next, I'll be going over kind of the structural layout. This is a very preliminary layout to get uh, sizing and to get weights. If you look on the primary screen, you can see the fuselage structures. Bulkheads are placed throughout the fuselage for high stress areas and for mounting the systems. As shown, we have bulkheads to the front and rear landing gear. Also, there's bulkheads to the front and back of each fuel tank to hold all that weight. Same with bulkheads connecting to the wing spar and the tail spars. Also, throughout the fuselage, every 30 degrees, there would be stringers. If you look on the secondary screen, it shows the wing and the empennage structural design. There's spars at the 20% and 70% cord length. And then the rib spaces, they're spaced out 24 inches apart. This 24 inches come from similar aircraft. And at the very, actually it's 10 feet from the wingtips, the rib is straight while the other ribs are 90 degrees off the front spar. We have that straight rib for where the wingtip needs to pull. Our aircraft has a very interesting role where it has to operate on aircraft carrier, meaning it can only be so heavy, but we have to deliver a large amount of fuel, which meaning we need the lightest empty weight that we can achieve. Due to this constraint, we chose lightweight materials to build our aircraft. We're going to be using titanium for the structures. Titanium has a higher strength to weight ratio than aluminum, so that'll give us weight savings that we need. For the skin and control surfaces, we'll be using carbon epoxy composite. This will give us a 25% weight savings compared to using aluminum. Um, this composite is well documented and used on other aircraft. The F-18 uses 25% composite, and the F-35 uses 35% composite. A few downsides that comes with using composite is the manufacturing time and cost is increased, um, but the benefits that our aircraft del delivers outweighs these downsides. Next, I'm going to be giving the mic to Spencer. Thank you, Joe. So for our empennage design, we chose a T-tail to assist on short takeoff and landing. This also allows for both of our refueling systems to be stored in the tail of the aircraft to fit right under the empennage. Um, we were constrained by that carrier deck, so we had to fit under the 18 and a half feet requirement. And uh, both control surfaces uh, do not inter interfere with each other at max deflection. So on the primary screen is the horizontal tail plan form. Uh, it is a 20 degree sweep to uh, keep with the uh, wing. It is a NACA 0010 to keep it symmetrical to uh, add lift both up and down. It is set at 45 inches from the fuselage, which is the center of the vertical tail. Uh, on the secondary screen is the uh, lift curves. Uh, as you can see, the max lift is denoted. On the vertical tail, uh, you can see a split rudder, which had to be accounted for because of the location of the horizontal tail. So we split the rudder to allow for uh, uh, control during a one engine out scenario. Uh, we chose a NACA 0016 airflow to allow for a little more structural stability because the horizontal tail is higher. And on the secondary screen is the lift curve of the vertical tail. Next for the stability and control portion. On the primary screen is the static mark uh, X plot. So we chose a static mark for an area of 150 square feet, which gave us a static margin of 8.3% to keep us in our stable range uh, during the course of our flight and a fuel offload. On the secondary screen is a similar plot for the vertical tail. We selected a 60 square foot vertical tail, which again allows for control during a one engine out, engine out scenario. Now for that one engine out scenario, our uh, Stall speed is that 97.9 uh, knots, as you can see on the primary screen. 
with the thrust and drag that were calculated uh, from the engines during an engine seizure, uh, our max rotor deflection would be about 15 degrees, and our minimal control speed would be 89.4 knots, as you can see on the secondary screen. For our static stability, a uh, criteria that had to be met in order to stay statically stable, the first one is our speed criteria, which is more important because we do land on a carrier, which is where the speed criteria comes into play. Uh, so when this, if there's any perturbation that causes an increase into drag, then the thrust has to be able to account for that, and that is uh, shown in the static, static or speed criteria, uh, which is stable. We're also stable in roll, pitch, and yaw. Next up would be Jacob with propulsion. Thank you, Spencer. <clears throat> On the primary screen, you can see the definition of our design point. The design point was constricted doing, was, sorry, was calculated using constraint analysis for our aircraft. We looked at, the design point is constrained by what we looked at the maneuver point, our takeoff, our climb, our stall speeds, and our landing. This design point was chosen to be at about a plus to weight ratio of 0 0.55. The, the max takeoff weight at that point of 75,000 pounds. At the beginning, we had to have a maximum of, or had, our engines, or sorry, excuse me, a maximum takeoff weight of 76,172 pounds and a thrust to weight ratio of 0 0.55 and two engines for our engine placement underneath the wings. Each engine had to grip, generate more than 20,936 pounds per engine. Uh, one constraint placed on our engines was because of where our engines were placed that the max diameter of each engine had to be less than 6.5 feet. From that design point, we looked at different engine choices such as low bypass turbo fans and high bypass turbo fans. Low bypass turbo fans were, con were considered because of the ability to give us excess thrust in a smaller diameter, um, and they also gave us afterburning capabilities for the need on takeoff. However, low bypass turbo fans were deemed inefficient, so after increasing the size of our fuselage, we looked at high bypass turbo fans. After looking at high bypass turbo fans, we chose the CFM 56-7B. Each engine gave us an installed thrust of 24,570 pounds. This is greater than our required thrust for the looking at losses and for um, the case that our weight would increase. Um, the high bypass turbo fan had a bypass ratio of 5.1. Um, it was important to have a bypass, high bypass turbo fan for fog protection needing to operate at a dirt runway. Um, one thing that we looked at, one thing that's very important about this engine also is that it does meet our diameter requirements at 6.1 feet, including the nacelles. After choosing our engine, we looked at a thrust available at altitude analysis. Um, this is shown on the primary screen. That we looked at, the, our requirements was to be able to operate up to 30,000 feet, um, as it is shown. And those um, thrust available at altitude will be discussed later in our thrust available versus thrust required. Uh, for our APU choice, we looked at different APUs and we came up with the choice of the T-62T-46-C16. Um, this one was chosen based off of a similar aircraft of similar sizes and systems, uh, such as the C-27J. Um, this APU will be used on startup when the generators on a dirt runway, per se, are not available, and because the engine need to be, need to be started off of um, both airflow and electrical power. Uh, the APU will be placed in the tail section, as shown on the secondary slide. Uh, next is into our fuel systems. For the boom, we had to operate in a um, operational requirements shown on the primary side. These operational requirements are based off of mill specs. Um, the flying boom, therefore, on the secondary side was designed to have a 28-foot shell. Um, it has an 18-foot telescoping pipe. This 18-foot this 18 tel telescoping pipe excuse me, goes up to the maximum this connect envelope as shown. Um, we maintain the typical design and operational envelope of um, Fine booms such as like the KC-35 is designed to that aircraft, our boom is designed to our aircraft to be lifted in that tail section. Uh, next is our hose and drug system. Uh, we went with the Cobb Hamfeth R600. Um, this has a maximum operating speed of Mach 0.5, which is important because uh, we had to refuel aircraft from 0.5 to 0.8 Mach. Um, this is the fastest hose and drug system that we can find available on the market today. It has a fuel transfer rate of 600 US gallons per minute. Um, the most important aspect is that we need to have a maximum hose rate as well. But the other most important, excuse me, aspect is we have a maximum hose rate 
of 80 feet. This is so that we can drop our hose out of the engine wash during refueling operations. For the fuel tank design, we have our most forward fuel tank number one. Our mid, our mid fuselage fuel tank is tank number two, and tank number three is placed in the, in the tail section. We also have wing tanks that we'll be able to have um, to give ourselves fuel for our missions. Um, these tanks were designed to be placed over the center of gravity, as shown on the primary side by the uh, darker dot in the middle. We also have a fuel receptacle that allows us to receive fuel from an Air Force Air Force tanker to extend our range. On the secondary side is our fuel tank design. This fuel tank design was de the fuel tanks were designed to be able to give us the maximum fuel that we needed to transport during our mission. Next, I'll hand it off to Marcus for a weight and dollars analysis. Thank you, Jacob. The weight of our aircraft was estimated using statistical weight estimation. This uses the dimensions and the design parameters of the aircraft to estimate the uh, component, weights of the components that make up the weight of the aircraft. Shown on the secondary screen are various weight parameters for aircraft. The max takeoff weight of 76,000 pounds falls within the maximum weight that the elevator on the aircraft carrier can lift. Shown on the primary screen are the structural and propulsive weight components of the aircraft. The engine weight was determined after the engine was selected, and the structural components include the weight savings due to the use of composites. Shown on the secondary screen are the weights of the components of the rest of the aircraft, such as the landing gear and the gear used to make the aircraft carrier compatible. The fixed equipment weight includes the systems not shown on screen, such as the refueling systems, the hydraulics, and the flight control systems. This sums up to an empty weight of 31,000 pounds. Shown on screen are the weights and locations of the fuel tanks and the crew. The fuel tanks sum up to a fuel weight of 44,600 pounds. <coughs> the extra 4,600 pounds above the requirement of 40. 40,000 pounds is to allow the aircraft to fly up to a required altitude and then dispense the 40,000 pounds and then have enough fuel to safely land. Once the fuel and the uh, crew are loaded up, the total aircraft weight is 76,000 pounds. So now on the secondary screen are the fuel tank center gravity locations as well as the loaded aircraft center gravity. As you can see, the uh, center tank number two is directly on the center of gravity of the aircraft. As such, this tank will be used as the main feed tank for the aircraft. All fuel required for the engines and refueling will be pulled off of tank two, while the wing tanks and tanks one and two will feed directly into tank two. Shown on screen is the excursion diagram for the aircraft. As you can see, the center of gravity shifts less than 4% of the mean aerodynamic core for the aircraft during the flight. This is important as over half of our fuel weight, or half of the aircraft weight is in fuel, so having the aircraft center gravity shift very little during flight is very important. The order of the, the, order of the fuel tanks was chosen to limit this. Shown on the secondary screen is the center of gravity uh, diagrams for the furthest forward and furthest aft center gravity locations. The furthest aft center gravity occurs during the empty configuration while the furthest forward center gravity occurs after the wing tanks are empty. I'll pass it on to Dominic Lammers for the landing gear design. Thank you, Marcus. Over the next few slides, I'll go over the landing gear and the tip-over criteria and some about the tail hook. On the primary screen, you can see our front and rear landing gear. We chose a tricycle configuration because this is used on, very, on a lot of similar aircraft that do carrier operations. The A3 Sky Warrior was used as a reference for most of this landing gear. Both struts will have oleodematic shocks, as these are very e efficient sh shocks and are used on many modern aircraft. The front landing gear has a retracting mechanism shown and has a carrier launch hook that will be in the down position when to connect to the carrier during the launch, and it will stow in the up position to be out of the way of the remaining operations of the front landing gear. 
the front main gear will hold about 20% of the static weight and then about 80% of the static weight will be on the main main gear, so 40% on each main gear strut. This is to allow sufficient weight on each strut for maneuvering on the ground. On the secondary screen, you can see the max loads expected in the red and the uh, loads that can be produced by our landing gear and tail hook in black. The landing gear can produce more, can absorb more energy than is predicted for uh, the most severe landing, and the tail hook can withstand more force than the force put on it during the, or when it grabs the resting cable during a carrier landing. On the primary screen is the tip back and tail strike angle. Each of these angles are required to be greater than or equal to 15 degrees, both of which are satisfied by the JTAC. The tip back angle is at 30 degrees and the tail strike is at 16. On the secondary screen, you can see the lateral tip over criteria. This angle is required to be less than or equal to 55 degrees and uh, the JTAC also satisfies this angle. On the primary screen is the wing strike angle. This is required to be greater than or equal to five degrees, and the JTAC satisfies this. During the landing and takeoff of the JTAC, none of the gear or JTAC's uh, wing systems will come in contact with the ground. On the main screen, you can see the storage for the main gear. The main gear will rotate forward and inward to store in the fuselage. This is seen at the top of the primary screen. At the bottom of the primary screen is the storage for the landing gear. There is sufficient space inside the fuselage to store the main gear and to allow for any expansion seen over the course of the JTAC's flight. On the secondary screen is the front gear storage. Again, this, there is sufficient space inside the fuselage for the main, for the front gear and sufficient space for any expansion seen over the course of the JTAC's flight. On the primary screen is the structural view with our landing gear there. The structures that, um, through the fuselage, were removed to allow the main gear to rotate into the fuselage, and longerons were used, were increased in size around this that space to account for the structures structural loss due to the landing gear rotating into the fuselage. On the secondary screen, you can see a similar uh, method was used to allow the front gear to rotate backwards into the fuselage. Again, the structure was cut out and uh, additional uh, thicker structures were used around it to account for the loss in this space. Our tail hook is rather uniquely designed. This is to allow for both the boom and the uh, tail hook to be center aligned as to not create significant moments on the JTAT during their operations. The tail hook is U-shaped and will fit around the boom. There are three locations for the tail hook. The cruise position is all the way forward. This is to allow the tail hook to be out of the way of the boom and can move down and telescope out and yaw left and right to allow the boom to, to fit into its operating window. When it, the JTAT is landing, the tail hook will rotate backwards and to allow it to intersect the arresting cable. And once it is on deck, it will then rotate up until it intersects the fuselage to allow for deck storage. On the primary screen, you can see the tail hook in its landing configuration. The angle of attack when the JTAT is landing is approximately eight and a half degrees. This means the tail hook will have to move down about 30 degrees to allow it to intersect the arresting cable at about the same time the landing gear hit the deck. In the, on the secondary screen, you can see the tail hook and the boom in the cruise configuration. As you can see, the tail hook is out of the way of the boom to allow it to move down and move uh, left and right during the refueling process. Next up is Noah Garcia with the performance verification. 
Take it out later. Behind me on the primary screen is the wetted area breakdown of the JCAT. The uh, wetted area was taken from the CATIA model and will be used for the drag predictions. On the primary screen is the thrust available, thrust required plot for the JTAT at sea level. The drag for the takeoff configuration and the landing configuration are also shown. It can be seen that at all speeds required, the um, JTAT still has excess thrust. It is also noteworthy that at Mach 0.8, which is our required maximum uh, Mach for refueling, we still have excess thrust as well. On the secondary screen, you can see a thrust available, thrust required plot at 30,000 feet. 30,000 feet was the altitude, one, the maximum altitude we were required to conduct refueling at for our mission. And we still have excess thrust at Mach 0.8. On the primary screen is our specific excess uh, power contours. <coughs> it can be seen that our absolute ceiling is just short of 60,000 feet. On the secondary screen is our flight envelope. The load factors selected were positive 3 and negative 1. These were based off of um, similar aircraft and recommended values from uh, Raymer's text for military transport aircraft. Behind me is our takeoff verification on a dirt runway. The request for proposal specified that the JTAC be able to operate from a 5,000 foot runway of either dirt or concrete. And it can be seen that the JTAC is able to take off and clear the obstacle in half of that distance. On the secondary screen is our range verification showing the amount of fuel being um, used up throughout our 600 nautical mile mission. And it can be seen that at the end of that mission, we still have 3,000 pounds of fuel, which we can use for either loitering or from a, for a diversion to an alternate landing location. On the primary screen is our landing verification, also uh, taken on a dirt field runway. And it can be seen that we complete our obstacle clearance and uh, we make it to a stop within 3,000 feet, which satisfies our 5,000 foot runway requirement. On the secondary screen is a landing verification with reverse thrust applied. The reverse thrust was assumed to be half of our uh, static thrust. I will now pass it on to Emma Schneider to go over our cost analysis. Thank you, Noah. On the primary screen behind me is the breakdown of our cost analysis. This is our RDT and E and flyaway costs. The unit cost will end up being around 109 million. On the secondary screen is a further breakdown of how this will work. It includes our hourly and our fixed costs. On the primary screen is our uh, team's labor accounting. The dotted line is the expected number of hours, while the solid is the number we have worked up to this date. On the secondary screen is a breakdown of what we've been spending those hours on. Uh, as you can see, the majority has been uh, professional development and administration. And for the cost breakdown, which is based off statistical analysis, it is professional development and engineering. Next is our recommendation, conclusions and recommendations. To conclude, all of our performance requirements have been met. We can take off from our 5,000 foot runway as well as our carrier deck. We are carrier compliant. We can fit under the deck, we can on elevators, and we can land. We are stable controllable even in an engine out situation. We are fully capable of, refuel of refueling both types of aircraft as well as uh, at our 600 nautical mile rate combat radius. It is recommended that we move on to our test phase, which would include fabricating models and conducting wind tunnel and structural tests. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Okay, in order to be fair to the panel so that over here on this side,
we don't have to look at our second and third uh, questions that we wanted to ask. We're going to start on this side. Thank you. Uh, very good presentation. Um, I think this is a very interesting airplane, and uh, I would be very interested to see what comes next semester with uh, detail design. Um, don't have too many questions. One um, area, though, is the, uh, the snatch loads of that tail hook, that bifurcated tail hook on landing. Um, have you taken a look at that, or will you take a look at that next semester? Did you say the peak loads during the yeah. tail hook? Got it. Uh, estimates from Raymer um, were used to find those peak loads, and that um, on that screen, peak load. Yes, those peak loads were considered, <laughs> and the peak load for that can the tail hook can handle is, is greater than the predicted peak load for it. Okay, and then the other one would be um, your three tank setup. Uh, I guess you're counting on fuel transfer always to the center tank to maintain CG. Should probably consider the. Uh, unlikely but possible event of a fuel transfer problem and how that would relate to static margin and what your uh, emergency scenarios might be if you can't get the fuel forward. Mark is going to answer that one. So the fuel systems should be interconnected amongst all the tanks, but in the case of all of the fuel tanks having a fuel, um, yeah, having a fuel uh, pump failure, the wing tanks should be able to gravity feed to the engines to allow the aircraft to um, safely <coughs> land. And yeah. I think. Yeah, I think I think I was I was talking about uh, if you trap fuel forward or aft. Oh, okay. And, and the effect on longitudinal CG. Um, so most of the fuel is stored within the uh, wing tanks and the center fuel tank. So if either the, fir the uh, first tank or the third tank uh, has fuel pump problems, the center grab will not shift okay. that much. All right. Yeah. yeah. Just make sure that's still within your envelope. That's all I have. Thanks. Nice job, by the way. All good. There's a lot of great information in here, and you know I'll probably get a little nitpicky at times, and I apologize. It's almost like you're selling me this plane. <laughs> so sell me the plane. But you know, I, I've got a couple of just simple technical questions. On um, you know, you're talking about like the field of view for the pilots. Where does that? Do they? Have, is there such a thing where they give you like the percentile of the person? Because whenever we're designing any kind of seat turn point, there's always you know 90th, the fifth percentile, etc. And this, I mean, is it? I mean, like I said, it is nitpicky, but it is significant. Is there like a specification you get from the DOD or something that says this is what you're supposed to do? For the forward uh, over nose vision and horizontal vision, a uh, 50th percentile normal American was used. Uh, I, when I was looking at specifications, I did not find specific specifications for certain percentiles to be able to look over the nose or have horizontal vision. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah. No, that's fine, because as you were saying, they do have a limit, because I've had friends that are too tall to learn to fly. But then I've seen some that fly to the bigger planes, and they're okay. Mm -hmm. you know, fighters are really okay. That's a huge limit. No, it's just, you know, nitpicky details, like I said. Another nitpicky detail that I had was, you know, the material selection. Titanium is very expensive. And uh, I'm just curious if, if you guys were able to do any kind of like a cost type study on that. No, I'm just, just going to get to that one. Yes, there were estimates um, built into the cost analysis yeah. for the titanium. Yeah. Um, basically, it increases the hours um, fact, uh, factors multiplied by these to increase for the titanium use. Yeah. And also for the graph back carbon cost. And like the material, it is very expensive. Yes, Sometimes in the material, yeah. Don't buy. There is a factor of 1.8. Mm -hmm increase for these things. It should be interesting. <laughs> and 
and I like the fact you guys are doing, using incredibly incredibly pots and things like that, like at BT and other craft do as well. Correct. But there are sometimes challenges you know, making that with the you know, parts. Um, the upside on one of the, the upsides of composites you guys didn't quite mention is it was a pretty good tea. And it's like that's the reason back in the day when the same way that wood you never know, worried about the colors you never fatigue because of nature's composites. And uh, sometimes that helps just structural layout, I know you did mention it was based on the plane, but when you lay these things out, is it just, uh, I mean, are you kind of reverse engineering the plane, or do you just put them on your own and the ribs and... It, it is based on the A3 Skywire. Uh -huh. uh, the uh, structural layout was the bulkheads were placed at the huge dress points, um, and the stringers were placed uh, 30 degrees. Um, as far as reverse engineering, we did do a little bit of that. We based, went, looked at similar aircraft and worked backward from there. Yeah. But um, we did um, just place some at the key locations based on part design as well. Yeah, because you know, I, I know it's a very preliminary design, but you know, there's a lot of material mistakes. I see what you're landing here, but my tanks are. I envision the tank here in the left below. Yeah. That, that'll be a challenge. And one last thing uh, would be who makes that APU anyway? Is it a Pratt or is it a? That APU was a, um, oh, I, mean, I have the document. I'm uh, looking at the document. I can see the document. I can see all of them listed out there. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that, that APU, I don't remember off the top of my head, but okay, I'll, be able, I'll, be able to that, I'll be able to get that question. That's, that's perfect. That, that's fine. For you. But yeah. the thing that I got is where you have a place, you know, usually the challenge is keeping that area. Right, well we wanted to keep, one of the problems that we had was we actually looked at originally putting it at the front of the aircraft, right. however that would be in front of our fuel tanks, and we wanted to keep the heat smoothness and the heat that would be given off by the exhaust and the APU away from the fuel sources. Yeah. So that's why it's placed in the tail section where we had more room, and to be able to put the exhaust up and out away from all of our key um, systems. The APU itself was enclosed with tanks, because I see something, that, I don't know if that's a bulkhead or a tank, the, the tank three back there, if you want to go ahead and go to the slide, it's a uh, slide 37 for you. Okay, can we go? A little bit. A little bit further. Up. No, yeah, up. Yeah, up one more. And one more again. No, so up. It's up. slide 36 feet. Yeah, 36 feet. Right here. So the APU has enough room back there, <coughs> it's hot enough to where we can move it back even further um, and still give room enough for the, for the exhaust. It just for this uh, preliminary design, we knew that it would have to go in that tail section. We had enough space to put it there. Mm -hmm. That's just a render of where it could be put it. Yeah. There's other things scared. Well, a lot of things scared me about that is this is even way before your time. It was 747 that took out of a NV LaGuardia or cannon that only exploded in midair. Okay. That's because they had put the uh, air environment control system underneath the main tank, mm -hmm. and that's what caused the fuel to vaporize. All we had was a spark. Right. Anyway, so I like to watch a plane crash with so, so. <laughs> <laughs> we, we hope that won't happen. Uh, we we won't happen. We're not so that that uh, that tail hook. I'm not quite clear of how when you have it tucked in, the lance comes down. How do you tuck it back in so that you can get the for the line here? No, for the tail hook. Oh, for the tail hook. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So the, there are. Can you go to the tail hook slide? Fifty. So there are two uh, 47. 47. Uh, circular uh, sections on each side of the tail hook. Actuators can be attached to these and uh, chains or, or um, cables will wrap around those two circular sections mm -hmm. and allow it to rotate forward. Correct. Now, the thing is, they're like the vehicle come back up, or you have to do that and Go from. See how you have it right there, right now? It's not clear. Deck that, storage? Well, it's on deck storage. Yeah. Right before you take it, will that be able to clear the deck and get back to the flying position? Uh, for once it is, um, the aircraft craft has taken off, it will yeah. do a checklist to rotate that tail hook all the way forward. Fly, right? Right. The tail hook will intersect the deck if we try and rotate it on deck. That's why there's three tail hook positions. Mm -hmm. So we had to move it back um, once it's on the deck. We didn't want to design any complicated linkage in there to allow it to come apart or um, rotate forward because of those high loads that will, it will encounter. I would say these are the human factors of having the two different positions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because there's bound to be a pilot that screws that up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's easier to make your so right. you, you can't make up a way something fine. <laughs> 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 Why do you know the pilot's going to be fine? Hold your hands full. That's the last thing I want to worry. That's the last thing I want to worry.
<laughs> okay, so uh, my, my first comment is a military aircraft design is inevitably going to be way more difficult to get through all the design parameters, I think, than a civilian one. So on that, I have a huge list of things that I, I will not be asking all of. <laughs> but my first thing is, this, this is designed to go on a carrier deck. Did you do any research into uh, the deck loading requirements as in pounds per square foot that, uh, that a deck carrier deck can handle, especially for the two conditions of static as in storage on deck and then the landing phase as well? Did you do any research into that? Uh, Joe's going to answer that. So one requirement that we did have is uh, the aircraft carrier's elevator cannot exceed more than 80,000 pounds. Um, so that's where we designed our weight to meet that requirement. Um, we didn't look up any uh, research on the individual tire loading. We're looking at similar aircraft that do use single rear tires um, with similar weight. There are, there are similar aircraft on an aircraft carrier that have loading like that? The, the A3 Skywear um, had a max takeoff weight of 80, uh, 82,000 pounds. My carrier, that was normally 80,000 pounds. And we do have bigger tires. Than the A3. So that one was able to operate, and we have a lower PSI on the deck because our tires are big. So and we also weigh less than the A3. Okay, so, so one last point on that is uh, consider the fact that that A3 Sky Warrior is on, is on, designed to be on aircraft carriers that don't really exist anymore. So look at current aircraft carriers. Um, one, one administrative note that I just Slide 15A. Uh, you have you were talking about your leading edge slats, um, but you call it out as a leading edge flap. That's just a that's just a typo miss. So uh, and I'll note that in the notes. Um, your CL curves. Actually, I'm going to do the CL curves thing for you guys. You guys can do that. So a uh, couple things specific that I don't think anyone else will ask. Uh, what is this max size of aircraft that can be refueled? Do you have any, have you done any thought about that? Uh, because I will tell you from the experience of my own brother who was a tanker pilot, uh, when a C-58 Galaxy comes up behind a KC-135, there's so much bow wave, rotating down the bow wave, it actually pushes the butt into the aircraft up, and now it's plowing in the sky, uh, which is a very uncomfortable condition for a pilot. Uh, so think about that, because if you're going to do something like refuel another LCAT, which was kind of one of my questions you don't have to answer, uh, but if you're going to refuel another airplane of your size, like an S3 Viking or something like that, uh, you need to really consider that. And the forward hinging location of your boom is going to suck that airplane right up underneath your airplane, and you're probably going to see what it does. Uh, and I'll just pick one more uh, up here. Slide 35A was uh, your thrust available at altitude. Thank you. Uh, have you calculated how much time it's going to take you to burn enough fuel off to get to your 30,000 foot cruise altitude? Yes. That looks like a pretty significant fuel burn. The fuel burn is about 2,000 pounds to climb up to the 30,000 feet. I believe that's about an hour, an hour and a half for the ascent to 30,000 feet. Okay, that's, that's a hell of a long time is in the military environment. Yeah. I don't think it's that. So run that calculation because that looks like a huge gap for me. And you might need to take some design consideration. Okay. Um, I know one thing for these sites actually. These are just the thrust available that we for our engines at each individual altitude, which is just based off the thrust available and the density. So these these did, these slides here did not account for those climb um, rates. Those are just for this is what we could get at those at each individual altitude. Okay. So. All right. Uh, nice job. Uh, this is a pretty full project. I'm sure you guys uh, uh, realize there's lots of compromise being made here, right? Um, trying to balance a pretty heavy airplane uh, with a significant fuel load uh, and carrier operation. So, um, uh, nice work uh, all around just tackling the problem on that. So, uh, I want to start off uh, asking about the boom a little bit, the 
we, we based that design choice off of the KC-46 because of our size requirements and where our tanks were placed. We know that will not, a uh, boom operator will not be able to climb back towards that boom operational area, so the co-pilot will be the one in charge and find the boom system, as like I said, for the KC-46. Okay, so you're going to have the provision for cameras and Correct. the like uh, in the tail? Correct. To be able to account for that? Yes. Uh, being that we had, I, I was showing a thing on, um, well, I think actually we can show them the next slide with the APU going to go down. Um, being that we have a lot of extra space back there in the tail section, a, a lot of extra space for systems and other things that were not considered during a preliminary design, we could, those would be able to be placed in that area. Except for the weight trade-off. Yeah, except for the weight trade-off, which I believe because of where our CG is at and the weights that were um, considered for most of these systems, um, we do have enough uh, breathing rooms there. Yeah, I'll tell you, from the KC-46, they're learning some hard lessons about <laughs> using cameras for uh, doing boom uh, refueling. Uh, it's uh, a non-trivial uh, problem to solve. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing it right now. Um, Maybe they need to hire a boom pilot or something. <laughs> So um, now onto the drogue. Um, you guys kind of co-located the, the boom and the drogue. Did you consider putting the drogue perhaps on the wings? And if, if you did, you consider it why you went with the design of the wings instead of putting it on the wings? Yeah. Um, because of spatial requirements of having to fold our wings and that our engines are big, um, we didn't have enough, we really didn't have enough room on the wing areas to put uh, the hose and drogue pods that would be typically seen on other aircraft using both uh, drogue and, and flying wing systems. Uh, so that's why we were going to be putting it towards that tail section. And that's why the design choice kind of went is that we think that this would be the best um, choice to where to put it. Especially because when we look at where our high lift devices are on the wings, the, the probe and drogue systems have the, um, would have a tendency to interfere with those uh, systems that are required to be had on the aircraft. So did you consider mounting uh, the pods, the drogue pods, you know, outward of the wing fold? Um, yeah, totally. yeah. We didn't want to put any um, systems outboard of the wing fold because it would um, overcomplicate the system. We weren't really sure how to transfer those systems across the hinge line. Um, for the same reason, we chose to keep all our um, high lift devices as well as our ailerons inboard of the wing fold um, because it, it would just it would complicate the design too much. Okay, that's that's fair and, and totally uh, follow your logic there. Um, one thing to you know consider uh, that would probably be a huge selling point for this airplane is if you had uh, wing mounted pods, potentially you could have had more full refueling operations happening. And so, you know, if you have a flight of F-18s that are really out this thing, and you can, you know, plug twice as much gas in them, right, effectively, uh, by doing dual refueling operations, that's that's a huge win, an operational win, um, for for a flight of, of Hornets. So, um, I I follow your logic, and that's that's really the design. Touchdown, there's a eight and a half um, 
All right, um, just, uh, just a couple questions to wrap it up. Um, we'll, we'll start with the, the good news, this was awesome. Um, you, guys really, uh, you guys really worked hard and put a lot of effort into it, so high five. Um, cruciform tail, slide 25. So, um, 25. 25. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> 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 Why the mid-mounted tail? Why didn't you just stick it on top? Uh, it seems like you added a bunch of complexity. So there's two reasons you didn't stick it on top. The first being uh, structural loads upon landing on a carrier. Okay. Landing on top is going to create a bigger bump and could be a little higher force. Okay. And then second, uh, it was called to my attention that pilots wouldn't appreciate ejecting with a horizontal tail that high. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's valid. So, um, I mean, certainly that's a consideration of the ejection, and you know, they, they need to make sure that you're uh, getting well clear. Um, I guess my question or concern is, um, hypothetically on approach or some higher angle of attack kind of thing, are you going to blank out that top rudder because you have that big bone to tail? Because that, that seems like a concern I have. Uh, that is a possibility, and right. I love the bottom rudder does have more surface area than the top, so you'll still have a uh, majority of control with our minimum control speed being significantly lower than our landing speed. Sure. Uh, it will be sufficient to control your aircraft. Okay. Yeah. Um, depending on how you design your ejection seat, that top mounted tail might not be a terrible thing, right. but there certainly are structure considerations and, and that sort of thing. Um, I like that you consider with your ejection scenario uh, not burning the other pilot. Um, <laughs> however, remember that now you have two rocket-powered rocket masses 
that are trained to not hit each other uh, in the air. So that's going to make it a little bit more of a complicated problem uh, for the ejection seat folks. Um, so there's 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 kind of some some give and take there. It's not necessarily a cut and dried answer. Um, let's see one or two other things. Um, what is I so I was trying to find a ground clearance slide. What is the clearance between the bottom of your engines and the surface, the landing surface? So a little less. Uh, so between the tarmac and the bottom of the fuselage? Uh, uh, and bottom of the engine. Well, especially the bottom of the engines. Okay. Uh, well, between the bottom of the fuselage is 36 inches. Okay. Um, the engines sit higher than that. Than okay. The okay. Uh, uh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, what, we, what we did originally is um, our engines were... Um, So the top of the, the top of the wings at you know, you know, the bottom of the engines is a little less than thirty six inches. A um, little less than thirty six. Okay, um, they're a little bit below the fuselage. You said a bunch of times dirt field ops. Um, those are giant vacuum cleaners. Yeah. Um, you might have some real thought issues. Um, so the one solution that uh, has been done in the past is really funny looking, but. They'll actually mount the engine in the structure of the wing, so it'll be a high wing with an engine-mounted wing, rather than underslung with pylons. Um, makes the structure way more complex, but it also keeps you out of the dirt. Uh, so, depending on how critical that dirt field ops uh, scenario is, um, that might that might affect it. So that's a little bit more of a comment necessarily than a question. Um, just one more, because I know we do need to go. Um, did you consider other landing gear designs? Uh, you had oleo struts. Uh, a lot of Navy airplanes really like trailing link landing gear. It's a lot more resilient and much easier to crash into the deck wing. Uh, did you consider that? Doctor, this. Uh, we did consider different landing. We did consider different landing gear options. Okay. Uh, the, these were used on the A3 Skyward, which we based most most of these off of, yeah. and um, they gave us what was required. So we decided to go with those. Sure. Yeah, you take a look at a lot of modern Navy aircraft, and they're all trailing link okay. because they're trying to be more resilient against those crashes into the deck. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Well, and thank you, panel members, all of you. So this uh, concludes the first two briefings. The